Hello, I am Robert Ellsberg. I'm the publisher of Orbis Books. I'm uh, particularly uh, excited today to be joined by uh, one of our authors who happens to be also uh, a friend, a mentor, a, a former teacher of mine at Harvard Divinity School uh, from many years uh, ago. Uh, Harvey Cox uh, has been, he's retired now, but a professor at Harvard Divinity School for over 50 years. Uh, you, you have probably read some of his books over the years, including his first uh, best-selling book, The Secular City, that was published in 1965 and became kind of a cause uh, celebre. He has uh, been well known for many books since then that often uh, take a kind of survey of the kind of cultural landscape in relation to uh, theological, religious, biblical uh, themes, including liberation theology, Pentecostalism, uh, world religions. Uh, and often he injects his own kind of personal uh, pilgrimage or journey as, as, as part of that story. So he's, he's not just writing as, as an uh, outside expert, but as a, as a kind of a pilgrim uh, in the, this landscape of, of the kind of borderline between uh, faith and doubt, uh, religion and culture, politics. Uh, his new book is called A New Heaven, Death, Human Destiny, and the Kingdom of God. It has a, a beautiful cover, uh, which he helped me pick. Uh, and I think people would be, first of all, interested to know what led you to this uh, topic at this point in your life. Okay, well, thank you, Robert. And thank you for the beautiful job Orbis has done publishing this book and, and also you editing it. Uh, what led me to it? That's always a, a kind of a mystery. You look back and say, hey, why did I, <laughs> did I start in, on this? And I think I was probably fated to do this book. And here's why. The house that I grew up in with my the family that I was with bordered on a cemetery. You can believe that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is where we played. We, hid, we, we played hide and seek behind the tombstones and we ran around a, a, there. And of course, I witnessed from a distance in the cemetery a number of funerals. Um, as, a, as a small child and even growing up, I became very uh, interested in what was going on, what was said. And uh, we, of course, heard about this in the uh, Baptist congregation I was raised in as well. So it was always in my consciousness uh, in a way. Then when I was a teenager, I had an uncle, his name was Uncle Frank. We, I was very fond of him. And he was the local undertaker. He was the funeral director in the town. And he asked me to work part-time for him once, which I did. And therefore, I, and he, he, he uh, planned and executed funerals for uh, everybody. There wasn't another undertaker. So we had black and white, Catholics, Protestants, Jews, anybody. So I saw a variety of different uh, funeral services. This is all stuff I grew up on, grew up in. Then uh, a year or two ago, uh, after I had uh, stopped teaching at Harvard Divinity School, I started a, uh, a uh, discussion group once a week with former students of mine who wanted to keep up on latest theological and religious trends and books and articles. And there was one particularly bright uh, student uh, named Rebecca Pugh. She's a congregational minister up on the North Shore. And she kept urging me during these discussions to write a book on heaven, which I did not want to do. <laughs> I said, Becky, I don't know anything about the subject. And I have... Uh, a little uh, experience of it, of course. And she said, look, the problem is there's so much kind of uh, mishmash of uh, folk beliefs and superstitions and half-cocked half religious beliefs and orthodox religious beliefs, Catholic, Protestant, and so on. It's all mixed together. And it's mixed together in people's heads as well. It's all inconsistent and... Uh, uh, confusing. 
So you want to write something that will uh, straighten this out. So I, I, uh, I said I didn't want to do it. But eventually she kept uh, hammering at me. So I decided that I would think about doing it. So I, I started writing this book. And what it turns out to be is uh, not a book about heaven, which I don't know anything about any more than I did before I started the book, but about views of heaven and the afterlife in their vast variety within Christianity, Christianity and other faiths over the years in Christianity, the different nuances and uh, there, there's no consistent picture. And remember also that uh, the idea of heaven is not a universal idea in the other religions. Uh, the uh, Buddhism, for example, doesn't like the idea of, of life after this life at all. I mean, they, their, their ultimate uh, goal is uh, to, be, uh, to be absorbed into the great nothing, the great nothing. And so that was, it's, it's hardly a parallel. But anyway, <clears throat> excuse me. Anyway, I started this process and I wide, read very widely and talked to people and came up with this uh, book. And, and there's, there's one thing that, uh, if there's one thing that strikes, struck me as I was writing the book, it was how much the different views of heaven over the years and then cross cultures influence the shaping of earthly society hmm. uh, on earth as it is in heaven, so to speak. Uh, uh, heaven became a kind of a template. This is the way they do it there. Maybe we should do it uh, here. Uh, it, uh, it was a kind of an idealized uh, uh, human society, or whatever else it was. So that's, that's what I, I did with the book. And it's, uh, it's, a survey of, uh, that is uh, multicultural and over the uh, centuries of Christian thought. And I didn't come up with any particular answer. I mean, people, people, when they found, found that I was writing this book, or did, they'd say, well, what does happen to you after you die? <laughs> and I, and I, just have to, I have to admit and say, well, I have my hopes, you have your hopes, other people. However, I'm, I'm not a definitive source on that. Well, obviously, one of the big religious questions or even motivations for religious reflection is the question of uh, what is the meaning of life that ends in death? Um, and so reflection on that and what comes beyond has implications for the way that we live in some way. Uh, one of the things that's really interesting in your book, and I think to a lot of Christians, gives pause to realize that, that heaven and the afterlife uh, was, was not a, a subject of deep preoccupation for Jesus in the Gospels. Uh, and he has uh, a whole different kind of uh, set of, of concerns, which have been now largely eclipsed and replaced by vivid and, and very uh, you know, colorful poetic ideas of what, of what heaven must look like. Yeah, there was a Catholic theologian in the last century who said Jesus came preaching the kingdom of God, but what happened was the church. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. I would say that uh, in addition to that, Jesus was uh, enacting and preaching and teaching the kingdom of God, which was going to be established on earth, here on earth. That, that's the whole idea of a kingdom of God, uh, but that what happened was heaven, mm -hmm. which Jesus very rarely mentions in the while He's not really particularly interested in that. And he's asked now and then about it, but he kind of uh, avoids the subject or he, he's really intent on telling people to prepare for the transformation of reality mm -hmm. into the reigning of God in the whole cosmos, the whole universe. So in a way, we got the directions reversed. Mm -hmm. Instead of uh, thinking about, uh, as it says in the book of Revelation, the, uh, the kingdom of the uh, new city uh, descending from heaven and onto earth, we have people thinking about 
getting out of this earth and up to some heaven somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been it's been a total reversal, which I think is a uh, uh, a uh, distortion, a serious distortion of what Jesus was talking about. Uh, so I was hoping to correct that a little bit. Now maybe that's hoping for a lot for me. <laughs> that's a, a rather large objective, but uh, I have been meeting two or three times and will continue now that the pandemic is over with uh, some ministers and uh, and uh, priests looking at their burial uh, liturgies and, and the uh, services that are, are the traditional prayers and they're all discontented with them they, they all all these uh, ministers and priests say uh, this is just a, a, a kind of a melange of all these different contradictory ideas. Uh, and we, we really need a serious reform of the uh, uh, burial practices and beliefs, uh, the funeral practices and beliefs in, in Christianity. Uh, so uh, I, part of the reason for writing a book was that, although we'll have to pick up on it again now that we can meet together. Mm -hmm. Uh, among your explorations, you're also kind of looking at um, evidence of of different kind of realms of reality beyond our normal kind of fixed uh, rational scientific uh, uh, framework, uh, and that you know through access through uh, psychedelic mushrooms, uh, you, you write about that. You write about uh, people who have reported. Uh, encounters with extraterrestrials. Um, uh, one thing you didn't uh, get into, I don't just didn't think it had time, was the whole phenomenon of, of so-called uh, near-death experiences and what people uh, have, you know, throughout history have reported uh, traveling to other worlds and uh, coming back to re report on that. Um, how does that fit in with your... Yes. Um, uh... The, that was a rather surprising uh, discovery as I was especially looking at some of the other cultures, well, even uh, of our own. There's one very interesting civilization uh, in, in uh, Australia that was puzzling to the anthropologists when they talked to, they tried to get people to talk about heaven or what happens after death. Or, and they, were, they, uh, they had the same word for what happens to people after they die, they go to be with their ancestors, but also to an alternate state, a kind of an alternate state of consciousness that you could enter into, enter into through ritual and uh, uh, meditation. It, it, and it was the same word. Mm -hmm. In other words, the, the, the heaven, they didn't make a distinction between this other realm, which is right here in our midst that you just kind of, at, at, at moments you can enter into and come out again. Uh, and then I thought about Jesus always saying something like the kingdom of God is in the midst of you, mm -hmm. or the kingdom of God is within you, as well as something that's coming to earth. It's got, he, he's, he, he also affirms uh, both of these possibilities, although it's kind of, no, nobody's quite, nobody quite knows what he, means by that, of course, but uh, it's confirmed there. Uh, now, uh, uh, you, you're right, I think, that the, the big question of human life, the, the big one, is uh, we are probably, as human beings, the only creatures who are aware of the fact that we are going to die. Uh, there's stories about the elephants going off here and there, or things like that, but they have, they have never been confirmed by uh, by uh, people who study animals. They say there's no evidence that they have any foresight or any inkling that they are themselves going to uh, die and no longer exist. However, human beings have that. We have that. It's not so much the fact of death as it is the awareness of our uh, finitude, which poses the big question, okay, if we're so finite, just a few years from birth to death, uh, and what 
questions did that raise about that brief span on on Earth? It's uh, uh, in, in this life. I think that's the. I really think, in many ways, that is the source of of a lot of uh, of religion. It's that question, and it's uh, it's uh, it's asked in virtually every culture. Although the, the answers uh, differ, of course, from culture to culture, um, but it, it is uh, it, there. It is, and and it, we're not going to uh, come to the answer very easily. But it's it's uh, interesting to explore it and see the different varieties of answers that have been given. I think your, your original title for the uh, the book was the unexplored country. Yeah. From from uh, Shakespeare indicating that 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 place from which no traveler uh, re returns. That that born from which no traveler has returned. Yeah. However, there are a lot of people who claim to have gone, exactly, yeah. to have traveled to heaven and come back, uh, lots of them over there. And I, I got very fascinated in reading those accounts. They go way, way back, I mean, to the Greeks. They, were, uh, they, they traveled and came back and reported it. And then, of course, there was all through the mystics through the Middle Ages. And, mm -hmm. and uh, the, one of my favorites, however, is uh, uh, Emanuel Swedenborg, 19th yes. century uh, theologian, who reported several journeys to uh, heaven and 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 he he, you know, he kind of he did it with a little bit of uh you could almost say tongue in cheek mm -hmm. he said uh, well uh this may have been a dream but here's <laughs> what happened and, I, uh -huh. and he describes all you, you have where, where how people live what their houses are like and, and all that and he was very popular bob during the 19th yes. century enormously influential figure in American intellectual history, uh, Swedenborg, uh, but there were there were some others. Remember, good old Saint Paul. Yes. Says he was snatched up. I, he says, "I know a man who was snatched <laughs> up in the third heaven." Yeah. Well, uh, we know who the man was. It was Paul. Yeah. But uh, he was the interesting thing about Paul's trip, a very brief trip to heaven, apparently, is he doesn't describe it at all. Doesn't no. say a word about it. And he also doesn't use it as a kind of a license for his uh, apostolic power. He just mentions it. And, and uh, he, he, but there were a lot of other people who were using heavenly journeys as, a, uh, as something like that. Um, now, that's, that's, that's a whole lot of fascinating literature. And maybe someday you should publish a, a, a book about you know, a collection of different <laughs> Travelers who did return from that point. I, I have read, I've, I've written some of those stories. I, you know, a lot of the the mystics uh, talk about you know heaven. I mean, or seeing heaven or being in heaven as something that we can achieve in life, not just something that happens after death. And it's uh, even you know modern theologian Dorothy Sole said that mysticism is not seeing God; it's seeing the world with the eyes of God. Uh, so a, uh, a a different uh, a different kind of way of seeing. And uh, I've just written a book uh, about Sister Wendy Beckett, the great contemplative and uh, art critic, and, and she was oh yeah her models yeah her had models, the television was, program for right a while. exactly I had a I had a long correspondence with her I'm, I'm publishing that and her kind of motto was always you know for me this is heaven um, and didn't mean heaven no no suffering or anything like that but just uh, living in the presence of God uh, that transformed how she evaluated all the things that happened to her the people she met and the suffering as well as the joys that she experienced. Yeah, but the big question that that raises is uh, uh, there are all these different accounts, and they don't they don't coincide with each other. Different yeah. views, mm -hmm. and how does one sort through them yeah, true. and and uh, land on or pick one or think that's the most sensible or it <laughs> connects with me? What's the basis for making those kinds of decisions? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I have to say, I don't know. 
<laughs> if it makes sense. Sometimes it doesn't make very much sense, but it has a powerful impact. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank uh, Harvey Cox very much for uh, writing this book and for joining me uh, today. Uh, I urge everyone to rush out and uh, buy this book. It, it is it is like all of his books. It is uh, informative. It is entertaining. Uh, it is fun to read. Uh, it's written in a very personal way uh, that amasses uh, massive uh, learning and knowledge, but presents it in such an accessible and clear and inviting way. Uh, and thank you, uh, Harvey, uh, for your uh, all you've taught me and your friendship for that goes back uh, 50 years. Back a long uh, way. Thank you. Thank you for having for doing this today and also for publishing the book. And please give my very warm greetings to Monica. I haven't my seen her for a long time. So bring her around here sometime. I'll bring her on stage as soon as I uh, close this off. Okay. All right, I'm going to stop recording. And thank you very much, Harvey. Yeah, you're welcome, Bob.